Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to KBKG's Employee Retention Tax Credits, Qualifications, Benefits, and Refunds. Uh, just a quick disclaimer here um, uh, for your reference. Please uh, use caution when uh, preparing credits such as these to make sure you have all the information. The information we cover here is pretty comprehensive, but it is not every aspect of the law, and you can't rely on this information alone to uh, ensure that you have addressed every issue. So if you're not completely familiar with this information, please seek professional advice. KBKG was established in 1999 with offices across the US. We provide turnkey tax solutions for CPAs and businesses. We've performed thousands of tax projects resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefits for our clients. Our team is a diverse mix of tax specialist attorneys and engineers from various disciplines combination of talent allows us to do the best of what we do and maximize the results for our clients. Um, and we're a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. So with that being said, I'm Jason Melillo. I'm the uh, principal over the Employment Tax Incentives Group. Uh, Ian Williams, my colleague, is the director uh, both over uh, tax uh, credits for employee retention as well as research and development tax credits. So Ian will be answering your questions in the background in the chat. Um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, the Employee Retention Credit, or, or ERTC, uh, originally established under the CARES Act. Like the PPP, the ERTC was uh, developed to encourage businesses to keep people employed during the pandemic. Um, amended and extended uh, under sections 206 and 207 of the Taxpayer uh, Certainty and Tax Relief Act, the TCDTRA of 2020. Like the Economic Aid Act, the TCDTRA was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. So Section 206 of the Act changed who may claim the ERTC, but not the computational rules. So originally, uh, if you took PPP, you were excluded from taking the ERTC, and then the TCDTRA changed that at the end of 2020. Uh, the period of, of computation is from March 13, 2020 to December 31, 2020 for section 206, which was the original uh, act. Um, and then 207 modified the rules, extended the period from uh, January 1 to June 30, 2021. It also changed the computational rules, uh, made the tax credit 70% instead of 50%, allowed for the credit to be $10,000 of wages per quarter instead of 10,000 of wages per year. Um, and, uh, and then the opportunity to retroactively apply for credits in 2020, even if the employer uh, received the PPP uh, loan for, from the SBA. So uh, some of the areas of official guidance that exist for ERTC uh, notice 2021-20, that was really the first guidance of any kind other than the IRS website. Um, and uh, under Section 2301, the uh, Coronavirus Aid Act and Economic Security Act, it kind of spells out the rules that most of us have relied on throughout this process. And then each time uh, the acts uh, were either updated or amended, new notices were released. So notice 2021-23 was the uh, adjustment or the update for the TCDTRA changes. And then 2021-49 was the change for ARPA. That actually extended the credit uh, for wages paid after June 30 and, and through December 31. And then uh, subsequently, when the government passed the infrastructure bill, in fall of 2021, they eliminated most of the fourth quarter for people. And so notice 2021-65 deals with the termination of the employee uh, retention credit under section 3134 of the code um, and the fourth quarter of 2021 for certain employers, which is typically the new startup businesses. And I'll talk about that. But these are these are your guidelines. This is where you're gonna go to, to rely on the majority of the information. So, uh, what type of employers qualify? Employers who fully or partially suspend operations during any calendar quarter of 2020 through Q3 2021 uh, due to orders uh, from an appropriate governmental authority, limiting commerce, travel, 
group meetings for commercial, social, religious, or other purposes due to COVID-19, or, uh, and in, this is 2020 alone, employers with revenue in any quarter of 2020 that was less than 50% of the revenue when comparing against the same quarter of 2019. It applies to employers of any size, including tax exempt organizations, but not governmental entities. And there are some limitations on benefits for large employers, smaller employers, and, and I'll cover this in a few minutes uh, of 100 or less, actually there's expanded benefits. Um, so when we look at uh, the changes to 2021 under section 207, employers with revenue in Q1 to Q3 of 2021, that's less than 80% of the revenue when comparing against the same quarter of 2019. So essentially that's a long way of saying if they had a 20% reduction in revenue when comparing to 2019, so Q1 of 2021 compared to Q1 of 2019, if that was down greater than 20%, then they would qualify for the revenue reduction, even if they didn't have a government shutdown. If they had a government shutdown, then they're automatically in if they were affected by that government shutdown for the period of the shutdown. Um, again, employers of any size, including tax exempt organizations, colleges, universities, hospitals, and medical care providers. So there's a subtle distinction between 2020 and 2021. Um, it was slightly expanded in 2021 to include these government organizations, colleges, universities, hospitals, state, if, essentially think about state run uh, organizations. Okay, so uh, what about the startup businesses that I mentioned? And uh, an employer that began carrying on a trader business after February 15, 2020, average gross receipts for the three year period ending with the taxable year that precedes the calendar quarter for which the credit is determined, cannot exceed a million dollars, is not otherwise an eligible employer due to full or partial suspension of operations or a decline in gross receipts, and credit for the third or fourth calendar uh, quarters cannot exceed 50,000, and it expires December 31, 2021. So you'll remember I said in the infrastructure bill that was passed in the fall of 2021, they eliminated the fourth quarter. They eliminated the fourth quarter of 2021 for everyone except for these startup businesses. So, um, and, and in that third bullet point there where it says uh, is not otherwise eligible, you know, if you're otherwise eligible uh, in Q3, for example, of 2021, um, it's likely that you will have more benefit from qualifying under the uh, otherwise eligible method because you're not going to be limited to that 50000 in credit. Uh, if you have sufficient wages, uh, you could have a million dollars in credit, where if you are claiming eligibility under the startup, um, you would be limited to the 50000 So you get, you get to choose whether or not you fit into one or the other here uh, is what they're telling you. Um, so the types of governmental orders include an order from a city's mayor stating that all non-essential businesses must close for a specified period, a state's emergency proclamation that residents must shelter in place for a specified period, other than residents who are employed by essential businesses and who may travel to and from work at the workplace location, an order from a local official opposing a curfew on residents that impact uh, operating hours of a trader business for a specified period, an order for, from a local health department mandating a workplace closure for cleaning and disinfecting. You know, during the pandemic, we saw all kinds of orders. You saw orders where, uh, you know, we talk about cleaning and disinfecting. Maybe someone was operating three shifts throughout the day and they had to go to two shifts because one of the shifts had to be available for cleaning in between each uh, shift. So um, you had stuff like that happen. Um, you had circumstances where People had restricted hours. Maybe they could only operate until 6 p.m. every day. So um, just these examples here are just to kind of give you an idea of what the, what the types of things that exist. But we saw orders from the attorney general, surgeon general, um, you know, for the court systems, for medical professions. Um, you name it, we've seen different types of orders depending on the state, depending on the locality. Um, and they're all different. You know, some states were affected tremendously by the pandemic. Some weren't affected as much. And so depending on the state that you're in, um, you may have seen more orders um, that, that will allow for uh, taxpayers and, and businesses 
to to get the credit um, where uh, same business in a different state with the same exact circumstances might not get the credit. So it just it was really dependent on on location in a lot of cases. So let's get into some uh, deeper examples here. We've got a governor that issues a, an order that all non-essential businesses must close from March 20 to uh, April 30, 2020. The order provides a list of the non-essential businesses. This was very typical. Um, it included gyms, spas, nightclubs, barbershops, hair salons, tattoo parlors, physical therapy offices, waxing salons, fitness centers, bowling alleys, arcades, racetracks, indoor children's play places, theaters, chiropractors, planetariums, museums, performing arts centers, just to name a few. This gave us, when we started seeing these types of government orders in, in, in early March, it gave us an idea of the types of businesses that we needed to look for when we were looking for employer retention credits. And, and so this might give you an idea as well in your client base of the types of, of clients that might've been impacted. But employers that were providing essential services could remain open, right? Governor's order uh, is a governmental order limiting operations of non-essential businesses entitling employers with non-essential business to claim the employee retention credit for wages. And I'm going to give you some detailed examples of businesses and when they were affected by these orders and what that looked like. Um, but uh, here's another example. We've got a mayor of City Y that holds a press conference in which she encouraged residents to practice social distancing to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We saw this a lot too. Uh, the difference here is the statement during the press conference is not an order limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings. Accordingly, the mayor's statement would not be a governmental order for purposes of the employee retention credit. Although in a lot of cases, while they did have the, these early press conferences encouraging uh, social distancing, there were a lot of follow-up uh, orders uh, limiting certain types of commerce or trade. So, um, you know, certainly uh, you'll be able to find those orders. Um, here's one, we've got employer C, a software development company that maintains an office in the city where the mayor did order that only essential businesses could operate. Employer C's business is not essential under the mayor's order, which requires employer C to close its office. Prior to the governmental order, all employees of the company teleworked once or twice a week, and business meetings were held at various locations. Following the governmental order, the company ordered mandatory telework for all employees and limited client meetings to uh, telephone or video conferences. The employer's business operations are not considered fully or partially suspended by the governmental order because its business operations could continue in a comparable manner. And I'm gonna give you the definitions for comparable manner, but that's something that you have to, you have to weigh. Um, and, and, you know, in this case, uh, this business was able to quickly shift to telework, but there are cases where businesses took time to shift to telework. And I'll get into some examples about that and how you can qualify in those circumstances. So one more quick example, and then we'll go into some other stuff about comparable manner. So we've got employer D operating a physical therapy facility in a city where the mayor ordered that only essential businesses could operate. The business is not considered essential under the mayor's order, which requires the uh, employer to close its workplace. Prior to the governmental order, none of the employees provided services through telework and all appointments, administration, and other duties were actually carried out at the workplace. Following the governmental order, the uh, employer moves to an online format and is able to serve some of those clients remotely, but employees can access specific equipment or tools that they typically use in therapy, and not all clients are, are able to be served the same way. Um, employers uh, D's business operations are considered to be partially suspended by governmental order because the workplace, including access to physical therapy equipment, is central to its operations, and the business operations cannot continue in a comparable manner. So let's look at that. If we're looking at continuing operations, if an employer's workplace was closed by governmental order, but the employer was able to continue operations in a comparable manner to its operations prior to closure, including uh, by requiring its employees to telework, the employer's operations are not considered to have been fully or partially suspended, right? So what does that look like? Well, employers that telework, does the employer have the support to make it happen? Um, you know, was there software that existed that they had access to right away? Or did they have to go out and find that software? Did they have to uh, develop the infrastructure, um, increase their bandwidth? You know, during March of 2020, um, 
unless somebody had their own internal IT team, in a lot of cases, that internal IT team is pretty busy because everybody's making the shift to telework. Not everybody had laptops to take home. So maybe people were setting up computers to, you know, unplugging their desktops and taking them home and setting them up at home. And IT needed to help people get plugged in and, and set up so they could work remotely. Maybe they needed to get a VPN set up. So with all of this happening, it was weeks in a lot of cases before people were fully up and running. And if that's the case, during that time that they were making that shift, they absolutely can qualify for the credit. Um, you know, what about the portability of the employees working? You know, if someone's got a manufacturing operation, that work isn't portable. And the example I gave about the uh, physical therapy facility, they couldn't take that equipment home. Um, so in some cases, the, the work just isn't portable. Um, the need for the presence of the employee in the physical workspace, can the employee's remote workspace be adapted to accommodate their needs? Sure, if I'm taking a lap home, laptop home, it's pretty easy to, to adapt my workspace. But if, if I have uh, big lasers that I'm you know, uh, cutting uh, sheet metal on or, or you know, drill presses or lathes, I can't set that up at my home. Um, and, and as I mentioned early, the transition of telework, how long did it take to make those, those changes necessary for the employee, uh, employee to be effective? Um, and and uh, amounts beyond a reasonable time could uh, qualify for a partial shutdown. And then something that's not on here, you know, when you talk about comparable operations, and we saw this a lot, when people had to uh, create uh, space, when they were required to make sure that there was social distance between employees, um, in a lot of ways, or a lot of cases, they were limiting their capacity. So they may have had an assembly line where people were spaced out two feet apart. Well, if they were required to space people six feet apart under the guidelines, um, that then is a, a, a potential shutdown order because they may have limited their capacity because they had limited space. They, they didn't have enough room to stretch people out six feet apart for what they were doing without limiting their capacity. So other things to keep in mind there that I, I just want you to make that connection. So let's talk about some specific examples here. An employer that maintains both essential and non-essential business operations, each of which are more than nominal portions of the business operations may be considered to have a partial suspension of its operations if a governmental order restricts the operations of the non-essential portion of the business, even if the essential portion of the business is unaffected. And this is really important because in a lot of cases, you have businesses that maybe have uh, one division that has essential, one of division that maybe has non-essential, or they have separate entities that get aggregated, and I'll talk about the aggregation rule shortly, but there's lots of different circumstances where you could have one portion of the business affected, one portion of the business non-affected, and they get to take the credit on all the employees. All right, so solely for the purposes of the employee retention credit, a portion of the employer's business operations that will be deemed to constitute more than a nominal portion of its business operations, if either of the gross receipts from that portion of the business operations is not less than 10% of the total gross receipts uh, using the same uh, calendar quarter of 2019, or the total hours of service performed by business uh, or by employees within the business uh, is not less than 10% of the total number of hours performed by all employees in the employer's business, both determined using the number of hours of service performed by employees in the same calendar quarter of 2019. So you're always looking to 2019 for this specific measurement. You're using 10% in both cases. One, you're looking at revenue. The other, you're looking at hours. And I'll tell you, we've got some examples here that are pretty interesting. So you've got employer A that operates an auto parts manufacturing and distribution business. A supplier of raw materials is required to, to fully suspend its operations due to a governmental order. Employer A is unable to procure the raw materials from another supplier. They're still able to secure other products related to their distribution business. The manufacturing business represents 20% of its revenue and the distribution uh, portion represents 80% of its revenue during the same quarter when compared to 2019. So they're gonna be able to take, that's, that's more than a nominal portion of the business operation. Therefore, they're gonna be able to take uh, government shutdown and all the employees are going to qualify for the credit in this example. So 
I want to look at another slightly different example with a twist here. We've got a retail company comprised of both brick and mortar locations, as well as an online ordering business that was subject to a partial shutdown. Um, and, and the physical limitations limited uh, customer capacity and hours of operations. On the basis of gross receipts, the brick and mortar part of the business represented less than 10% of the total gross receipts. Obviously, in that case, then you'd think, okay, then they don't qualify because that's not more than a nominal portion of the business components or business operations, and it would disallow the business the whole uh, relying on the shutdown uh, related to, to the business. But when you look at the hours component, the retail business hours in 2019 were actually substantially more than 10% because they just have to staff during the hours they're open, even if the sales were maybe concentrated in a shorter period of time. And so when they looked at that, the brick and mortar locations represented about 30% of the total hours, which is well more than a nominal interest. So they were able to take the credit on both the retail locations as well as the online ordering business, all employees, because all employees were being paid during that time. So, you know, we've talked about the shutdown orders. Um, the other side of that was the gross receipts that I talked to. Uh, in 2020, right, it's a 50% reduction in gross receipts. In 2021, it's a 20% reduction in gross receipts. Calculating gross receipts with a for-profit entity, we're looking at total sales, less returns and allowances, plus the investment income, interest, the dividends, rents, royalties, annuities, less the adjusted basis and any assets sold. So if you've got capital gains to deal with, you're, you're not looking at the gross sale, you're looking at the, the, uh, the actual gain amount itself. Now, what's interesting about this is, what if you're pre-revenue? What if you had a startup business in 2020? Well, if that, if that startup business in 2020 had investment income that it was living off of, maybe it had, was venture funded or, or funded by uh, uh, cash that was being invested in an account, and they're generating some interest and dividends on that. Um, if you compare their 2019 interest and dividends to their 2020 interest and dividends, and they had spent down that money, um, it's very possible that in many cases, they would have been below that 50% threshold or by 2021 below that 20% reduction threshold when measuring the investment income 2020 to 2019 or 2021 to 2019. So just keep that in mind that there are some cases out there where you're able to pick up pre-revenue companies and, and get credit on their, their employee um, wages. Now, for the not-profit, non-for-profit entities, we're looking at total sales for all activities, less returns and allowances, of course, uh, same uh, uh, investment income, but we're also looking at uh, uh, contributions, gifts, grants, or member dues. Who are the qualified employees? Well, you'll, you'll uh, recall I mentioned earlier that everybody can qualify for the credit, but there's some, some limitations uh, depending on the, the, the wages. Um, employers with total full-time employees of 100 or less in 2019 can qualify for the credit for any employees that receive qualified wages during the specified period of 2020. So once you know they qualify, they had a shutdown order, they had a greater than 50% reduction in revenue when compared to 2019. If there are 100 empl full-time employees, and we'll get into the definition there in a second, but if there are 100 full-time employees or less, everybody can can take the credit on their wages, uh, provided that they weren't wages used to to uh, for PPP forgiveness. If they have more than 100 employees, then they can only take the credit on employees that were paid uh, wages for sick pay or family medical leave due to a COVID-related circumstance. Basically, I want you to think of it this way. If they were paid to stay home, then they would qualify for the credit if they're greater than 100 full-time employees. Okay, in 2021, under Section 207, the rules are different. It's a 500 employee threshold, 500 full-time employees uh, measured again in 2019 can qualify for the credit for any employees that receive qualified wages. So if you're less than 500 and you had a 20% reduction or more in 2021, um, then you, every employee can qualify on all wages except those wages used to satisfy PPP forgiveness. If you're greater than 500 employees, just like the uh, 2020 rule for 100, only employees that are paid to, uh, to stay home. Okay, so what's a full-time employee? 
means any employee who with respect to any calendar month in 2019 had an average of at least 30 hours of service per week or 130 hours of service per month. So we're, if, if they were 130 hours of service in the month, we're counting that one employee for the month. We're going employee by employee, month by month. So if someone worked 129, 129 hours one month and 130 in the next, there's zero in month one, there are one in, in month two. And then at the, end of the, at the end of the year, we're adding those up, dividing by 12, and that's the number of full-time employees that we have uh, in the calendar month. So we're, we're taking that, that average. Um, so, so if you have, uh, let's say, a large franchisee that operates a lot of franchise units and they have a lot of part-time employees, they could have three or 4,000 employees, but still be below that 500 employee, full-time employee threshold because they're only measuring those people that work more than 30 hours a week. Uh, an employer that started uh, its business operations during 2019 determines the number of full-time employees by taking the sum of the, of the number of full-time employees each full calendar month in 2019 in which the employer operated the business and dividing it by the number of months. So if you don't have a full year to work with, you're not dividing by 12, you're just dividing by the number of full months of operations. So if you started in mid-June of 2019, you're not going to count June, you're only going to take six months, July 1 through uh, December 31st. If you started a business in 2020, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to use 2020 as that threshold for determining your full-time headcount. Okay, so what are qualified wages? Well, all, all wages paid to employees within the determined period, plus all qualified healthcare costs. So, so the key here is if it meets the definition of a wage, um, it qualifies. So tips, for example, if you've got restaurants, tips are qualified as a wage, those get added in. So, uh, you know, there's lots of little nuances here. You want to make sure that you're, you're making sure to calculate things correctly. Uh, wages are limited to 10,000 per qualified employee per year for 2020 only, and that's for periods March 13, 2020, ending December 31, 2020. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the credit amount is 50% of those qualifying wages. Now, for 2021, big difference, 10,000 per qualified employee per quarter for periods beginning January 1, 2021 and ending September 30, 2021. The credit amount is 70% of qualifying wages, not 50. So, you know, in, in uh, 2020, where it would be limited to 5,000 per employee, if you qualified for all three quarters of 2021, you're talking about $21,000 per employee. So pretty significant uh, benefit here. Uh, note that wages used to qualify for forgiveness related to a first draw PPP loan or a second draw PPP loan do not qualify for the ERTC. As I mentioned before, no double dipping. So uh, we can't, can't take the same wages and use them for the same purpose twice. Um, although we can optimize, uh, but, but uh, that's a little harder to do now that most people have submitted all of their PPP forgiveness, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a second perhaps. Um, so here's a really simple example. We've got a manufacturing company, 10 employees in Q1 of 2021. Uh, they, they qualified revenues were only 70% of the, the prior years or, or the 2019 Q1 revenues. So we know they qualify. None of the wages were used to qualify and offset PPP forgiveness. So you can see that uh, column one shows the wages. Uh, column two shows the, the limitation or the eligible wages because we're capped at 10,000. You see the credit percentage, you see how that calculation is done. Super simple. Um, you know, once you once you factor in the PPP forgiveness into it, it's a, it gets a little more complicated, but uh, still not, not rocket science. In 2020, we've got Q2 of 2020, uh, this particular uh, company, same, same circumstances, um, had uh, uh, a PPP loan of 225,000. So they had to, to reduce wages by the amount that they were reporting uh, for PPP. So employee one had 25,000 wages, 8,000 was used for PPP, 17,000 was eligible for, or available for ERTC, only 10,000 was eligible, the credit is 50%. You can see the $5,000 credit. If you go on down the road or down the line here, you can see employee five had 10,000 of total wages, 
2,000 was used for PPP, 8,000 was unclaimed, 8,000 is eligible for ERTC because the cap is 10, and their, their credit is limited to 4,000. So again, not, not, not too, too complicated, but when you are looking at multiple quarters of ERTC qualification and multiple periods of PPP uh, forgiveness and how you optimize that uh, was definitely something that, that could make a big difference in the amount of credits that you claimed and still make sure that you maximize your PPP. So if you have not submitted for PPP forgiveness and you do happen to qualify for ERTC, just make sure you're looking at that. But by now I know most people have submitted their PPP uh, uh, submissions. So during March and April of 2020, we've got an employer with greater than 100 full-time employees subject to a governmental order and, and partially suspended operations of its trader business. In response to the governmental order, the employer reduces employees' hours by 50%. And they reduce the employees' wages by only 40%. So the employer is continuing to cover 100% of the healthcare expenses here. So they're actually going to get credit on 10% of the wages and 50% of the healthcare because they're paying for something that the employees are not performing a service for. And because they're paying for that, the credit is out, they're eligible, the wages are eligible for credit. So uh, what about for furloughed employees? Well, we've got a large employer subject to governmental order that fully suspended operations. Um, they lay off or furlough all of their employee, but they don't treat them as terminated for employment tax purposes. Um, they're not paying any wages, but they're paying 100% of the employee's health plan expenses. Because those employees were sent home, because the company was paying 100% of the health plan expenses, all of those health plan expenses are treated as wages for the employee retention tax credit. All right. So let's talk about affiliation rules. Each employer must apply the aggregation rules of IRS section, IRC section 414 M and O, as well as section 52 A and B. Under 414 M, an affiliated service group is treated as a common employer based on, on rules, based on the performance of services by one entity for the benefit of another entity. So think about management companies and, and things of that sort. And then you've got uh, the rules for corporations under 52A. Uh, you've got parent subsidiary group where a common parent owns 50% or more of the subsidiaries. You've got a brother sister combined group where five or fewer people own 80% or more of the co uh, corporation. Uh, if it's a combined group in which a group of three or more corporations, each of which is either a parent subsidiary group or brother sister group, we're looking at all of those together. And then 52B is the same as 52A, it just applies to anything other than corporate entities like partnerships, trusts, et cetera. So let's go through a couple of quick examples here. Um, taxpayer owns 80% of two restaurant partnerships and 100% of an affiliated management company. One of the restaurants is a full service restaurant that was shut down for dine-in meals due to the governmental order. The other restaurant was a takeout restaurant, was really unaffected by the shutdown. So how do we know which ones we're looking at and, and which sales do we do we factor in? Do we aggregate all of them uh, or, or do we treat them each individually? Well, here's, here's the sales you've got in the upper left-hand quadrant, the dine-in 2019 versus 2020. You can see that they had uh, multiple periods where they were below 50%. So if we were looking at this as a standalone, this one would qualify for all three quarters because you're really looking at the first quarter that they drop below 50, and as long as they don't uh, surpass 80% of their 2019 revenue, then they would continue to qualify. But we still don't know yet whether we're gonna loop these all in together or treat them separately. Um, takeout, they were pretty much unaffected. The management company, you see that was unaffected. If we have to aggregate them, and remember this was more than 80% common ownership, um, so they are gonna get aggregated, you have to look at their revenue uh, combined. And when you look at their revenue combined, they don't actually qualify, right? Because they never had a greater than 50% drop in revenue. But if you recall, I mentioned that uh, they had a shutdown order for their dine-in restaurant. They were ended up making that to go only. Because that dine-in restaurant represented more than a nominal interest, remember our 10% nominal interest, because it represented greater than a nominal interest, the whole group qualifies for the employee retention credit. So that's what I'm saying here. All three, all three companies qualify. 
Uh, we have to look at them on an aggregated basis. Um, and just a reminder, if any one of those had taken PPP uh, uh, forgiveness on wages, we would be backing out those wages. So here I'm changing it up on you a little bit. We're going to assume that it's not an affiliated management company, that uh, that that these are not uh, combined. So we're not going to aggregate any of them. We're going to look at them each individually. So the dine-in restaurant would qualify. The takeout would not. The management company would not. So um, you you can see we'd qualify for all three quarters of 2020. Um, Oh, and actually, I, I take it back in my example here. I was saying that uh, that we we did have common ownership with the management company, so that would qualify. So uh, a couple of things, and then I'm going to kind of open it up for questions and some discussion. Um, how do we claim the credit? Uh, upon completion of the calculation of the credit, you have to claim the credit on an employer's amended quarterly federal tax return, uh, Form 941X. Some final tax considerations. Um, you know, the, the, if, if you're addressing this now and you filed your 2020 tax return, you're going to have to go back and amend your 2020 income tax return. You're going to have to amend your 2021 tax return if you also filed that one. You can retroactively, retroactively claim them on an amended payroll tax return. Um, and amended payroll tax returns for the year 2020 must be received by the IRS by April 15, 2024. So plenty of time to get that done, um, but uh, certainly uh, uh, the IRS is taking about 12 months to process these claims right now. I know big surprise for those of you who have been working with the IRS in any capacity, you know how uh, depleted their service level is at the moment. And, and part of it is the fact that they're short staffed and there's an extra, you know, six or seven million uh, taxpayers applying for quarterly amended payroll tax returns, which means that, you know, there could be, I don't know, 20 million additional returns that they're dealing with. So um, uh, let's see if to the extent that an employer files an adjusted or amended pay, uh, tax return to reflect uh, adjustments and they owe tax any penalties for failure to timely file or deposit tax will not apply if the taxpayer can show reasonable cause and not willful neglect of those failures. So this has more to deal with if you're dealing with a 2020 employee retention credit um, and the taxpayer says, I didn't know I qualified. I, you know, the rules changed after the fact and, and we went back later on. Um, it, it's, it's likely that they will have uh, there's there's some guidance out there that says that they have a position uh, that they can uh, uh, avoid penalties for the late payment of tax. Um, so like I mentioned before, taxpayers that have not yet applied for PPP forgiveness should keep in mind PPP is completely tax free. The coordination of ERTC and PPP is important in order to optimize the, the benefits of both. You know, um, uh, certainly, this is a service we're providing. We're happy to help taxpayers. We're happy to help you if you're if you're dealing with this. We're happy to answer answer questions. Um, you know, some of this stuff gets gets a little bit sticky. Uh, you know, I know that we get a lot of questions on supply chain, and and Ian, I I, I want to have a little bit of a dialogue about that. You know, I gave an example of a manufacturer where they were unable to get raw materials, and that qualified them during the period of time that that they weren't able to get raw materials due to a shutdown order. And this is something that I think trips up a lot of people because they, they, they get the impression, well, we, we have supply chain problems. We're not getting products coming from China, for example, but that isn't as a result of a government shutdown. And I don't know, Ian, if you've seen any other examples lately that, that have come up or, or, but this is the one that everyone seems to want to, to capitalize on. And, and it's out there. You can get it for shutdown orders uh, related to supply chain, but give give me some other thoughts on on this, Ian. What do you what do you yeah, see? Yeah, I think I think it comes down to the fact that there is kind of coincidentally and somewhat indirectly both a worldwide supply chain disruption and COVID. Right, one is somewhat related to the other, obviously, 
but the supply chain disruptions aren't necessarily because of COVID orders, which is the way the ERTC rules were written. Um, just as Jason just said, specifically, your supplier needs to be shut down by a U.S. government order related to COVID. Um, so if they're having some other reasons they can't get their supplies to you that are unrelated to a, you know, a, another government shutdown for, for ERTC, then that's not going to fit that criteria. So that's something that we've seen, you know, very commonly, um, you know, being probably misused and, and misapplied. So just be aware of that. If someone, you know, tells you you definitely qualify via that, you really have to dig into the facts. Um, and then even if your supplier is shut down, you know, were you able to find an alternate supplier? That's another factor to consider there. So that's probably one of the harder uh, cases to to document and prove your eligibility. Um, yeah, so definitely be aware. And I, and I would say the key is there to have really good documentation on that, because for sure, those are the types of things that are going to get audited. I know that there have been some providers out there really pushing supply chain as a viable qualification. And if you look at the regulations, if you look at the rules, it does not specifically address, you know, foreign supply chain disruption. Absolutely is not the same as a COVID related government order shutdown. So yep. be really careful there. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And I think on that note, uh, I had a, a good question came through with, you know, our, our opinion of CDC and OSHA requirements, or I should say CDC and OSHA guidance as a, as a governmental order for a shutdown. Um, and that's something that obviously we haven't reviewed every single order that's been out there. Um, generally, CDC uh, guidance was just that. It was recommendations and guidance that applied nationwide. Uh, they typically weren't giving strict requirements because they were kind of giving overall guidance for everyone in the nation to follow. Uh, so we, you know, we don't use CDC guidance as evidence of a governmental order that, that would have applied a shutdown to your companies. Um, OSHA, you know, it's probably very dependent on the facts and circumstances and in industries and companies, right? Um, their orders might have been more into requirements for some companies, not for others. So just be aware of that. Generally, we're looking at, you know, state, county, city, uh, you know, executive orders related to COVID. Those are going to be your best form of concrete evidence that you were under a shutdown. Um, and then even then, you know, your facts and circumstances might might still need some explaining as to how you might fit into that, that order. So just be aware of that. Um, if something sounds too good to be true, then usually it is. Um, so if you don't think that you were shut down and someone tells you you were, then you might want to take a good look at the documentation before you proceed. Well, Ian, I think another good comment on this is regulatory requirements. I know that we've seen numerous cases where there's regulatory requirements, let's say specific to the healthcare industry, um, that require certain rules to be followed um, relative to explicit COVID orders. Uh, I know we had uh, just one that we looked at, a skilled nursing facility, where they had requirements. They had to reserve a certain number of beds for COVID cases, and they had to keep a certain number of open beds for COVID exposures. And so that limited their capacity, and that wasn't necessarily... Uh, you know, a, a city or state government order, it was an agency regulatory government order. And so I think that that the point here is don't just stop it at city, state, municipality type governmental orders. It, and this was, you know, an essential service. You have to look to all types of governmental orders that affect that particular business. So regulated businesses are, are great ones to look at because they did have really specific rules that had uh, tremendous limitations that weren't always clear on how they might qualify, but but could in fact qualify. Yep, no, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. And and depending on the industry and even the location, you know, those orders from their regulatory authority might have come through as guidance. They might have come through as requirements. So we've seen that vary, you know, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, and just speaking, I had a question come through on like documentation. You know, I think the key that you should look for uh, in your documentation of this is reference to the specific orders and the language in those orders that applies to your case, right? Uh, the more generic it is, the less likely it is to hold up, you know, under IRS scrutiny. So 
um, just keep that in mind. Um, a couple of questions come through on, you know, the full-time employee count, the 130 hours, or, you know, the, I guess the way that wording comes through, and this is maybe just for discussion, um, you know, the definition is unique and, and different from PPP full-time equivalents, and I know Jason addressed that earlier. Uh, it's going to be any employees that had more than 30 hours a week or 130 hours in a month qualify as full-time, and then you kind of count that up per month, average it out over the year for 2019. It's listed as an OR test, but I had a question come through, you know, where they might have been really close, depending on how you calculate that. Again, for, think about it from an IRS documentation standpoint. You just want to make sure you document your position well. Um, in the event that the IRS does, you know, audit you, you want to make sure you feel good about your position there. Um, you know, not the, the notices do provide a lot of specific examples, but they don't cover every case. Um, so you want to make sure if you're kind of falling into a gray area or something that just wasn't addressed by the IRS, that you're still documenting kind of why you think you qualify and why you do fit in under the rules as they were written. Yeah, and, and I know that, um, you know, some of these bigger, you know, the IRS is strapped right now. They don't have a huge uh, pool of, of payroll tax auditors, but they are hiring to to audit these and and uh you know certainly those those larger cases are going to get looked at you know uh so just be be careful make sure you're linking the the shutdown order to the 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 company through a, a memo that you're documenting it clearly uh it, it that you're retaining uh the the information to support the the sales documentation if it's due to a revenue reduction um that you're consistent, you, you know, making sure you're using the right method, um, because that's where it's going to be easy for them to. Anything that becomes subjective um, is going to be easy for them to kick it back and say, "No, pay us back the million dollars plus interest." And that's going to be a nightmare of three years from now. You're scrambling to find that information. So make sure that you have an audit-ready package. Everything that we do. We're doing it so that it's audit ready. We have a, a full report that that you know literally could be handed over to the IRS in, in, in an audit. Just make sure that you're getting that. If you're working with an outside party or you're preparing preparing it yourself, have everything there that's ready to go. Yep. A couple other um, you know I'll say more common things that we've run across in the past that, that I just saw a few questions come across. Did have a lot of questions come in. So thanks everyone for submitting your questions. I got to as many as I could probably until the last few minutes here when we were when we were talking. So sorry if I don't get to everyone who comes in. Um, majority owners, you know, I know early on the notices weren't super specific in their language on that. Um, notice 2021-49 came through and that really addressed the majority owners being excluded from the credit. So just keep in mind, anyone above 50% of an owner, um, you're going to want to exclude their wages from the credit. Um, if there are a couple relatives that that own the company together, and you know, no one person exceeding 50%, you probably have to combine their ownership together to look at that 50% test. So just keep that in mind. And then from a gross receipts test, got a few questions that came in. You know, just keep in mind there that if you do meet that 20% reduction for that 2021 credit calculation, you know, any quarter that meets that 20% reduction, you qualify until the end of the following quarter until you get back above 20%. Um, so anytime you're meeting that test, you're generally gonna get two quarters of qualification um, with the one exception being, you know, the prior quarter rule that Jason mentioned where you can actually look at your Q4 of 20 compared to Q4 of 19. Um, and that can qualify you uh, for Q1 of 21. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot I, of people look at one quarter and, and that's it. And, you know, you might be missing out on a significant credit there. Yeah, I did kind of gloss over that for 2020. And I want to make sure that we reemphasize that. 2020, the revenue reduction is 50% for any 2020 credits. But for Q1 of 2021, you can do that look back. It's an election. You can look back to Q4, as Ian said. And it's a 20% reduction. So if you had a 20% reduction in Q4 of 2020, when measuring against 2019, that will qualify you for Q1 of 2021. So I, I did kind of speed over that, and I wanted to make sure that we just touched on that again because that's a pretty significant. Uh, we we saw a lot of people qualifying that Q4 
that didn't otherwise qualify the rest of the year or any other quarter, but they picked it up and got a lot of credit through that Q4 uh, uh, election. So, yep. Yeah, and maybe one other note on that. Um, when you're looking at a gross receipt, it needs to be on the same basis as your tax return. Right, so we did talk some, on some that. People met, some people met that Q4 reduction because they were looking at it on maybe a cash basis instead of accrual basis. So you want to make sure you're looking at it on the right basis from that perspective as well. Um, and then from a shutdown perspective, because I got this question a few times, you know, if you had a one-month shutdown that applied to your business, then you're – your qualifying wages or any wages paid during that one month shutdown or whatever those shutdown dates are. You're looking at paycheck dates within that shutdown period. And then you're also making sure you don't double count with any PPP that might've been overlapping with that period. So just keep, keep that in mind. It's not as, you know, the grocery receipts test gets you at least an entire quarter of wages. The shutdown test gets you the wages paid during that specific shutdown period. Right. And, and as you pointed out, it's paid wages, not earned wages. So that is a that is something that that could be a little bit confusing for people, but it's just it's it was easier to administer that way, and that's why they chose to do paid instead of earned. Yep. Well, that's all I got. I, I did put up our yeah. contact information for people that if if you have any questions or you need help, let us know. Uh, shoot us an email. We're happy to help you out. Uh, answer any questions. Um, good luck with this stuff. I know we're. we're uh, we're still seeing a, a ton of these projects coming through. So there, there's still plenty of opportunity out there. Make sure you're going through your whole client base uh, and talking to everybody about it because I, I've been finding that people that that thought that, well, our revenue was up. Well, just because your revenue is up doesn't mean that you can't qualify because imagine had they not been subject to shutdown orders, how much more their revenue could have been up. And so we have seen a number of cases like that where people have said, well, maybe maybe one out of you know 20 or 30 people might say, but we didn't have an economic impact other than we didn't have a loss of revenue, but we were subject to a shutdown order that could still qualify. So just keep that in mind. Um, again, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you for your attendance today. I really appreciate uh, all the great questions that we had and, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.